Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome on this bright and early Tuesday morning. Um, I think the last sunny Tuesday in the UK for a while um, to our breakfast thinking, uh, which today asked the question, how can we dismantle white supremacy in tech? I'm Mary Mills. Uh, I'm an editor here at Tortoise and I'm your uh, chat host and co-editor for today. But our host today is actually a, a Tortoise member uh, and a guest editor, I should say, uh, Yasmin Abdel Majid who is a journalist and award-winning social advocate uh, with a background in mechanical engineering and is also one of the 2020 LinkedIn change makers, which makes me feel uh, very underperforming. Um, as I said, she's our guest editor for today and I'm going to hand over to her in a second, but just so you know the formalities before we get started. I know you know this by now because we've all been on so many Zooms, but uh, take part by raising your hand in the uh, toolbar at the bottom or get stuck into the chat where I will be. And uh, I should also, before we start, just thank Hatuzia, who we partnered with to produce this thinking this morning. So um, over to you, Yasmin. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Murphy. And good morning, everyone. Glad to see everyone in, um, at 8 a.m. on a Tuesday. It's very exciting. So I'm going to introduce our, our lovely guests today, and I'm going to start with Kenza, Kenza Aitzi Abu. Kenza is a senior manager for robotics and artificial intelligence at um, Deutsche Telekom. So she, but I should also say that she's not here representing um, the telecom company. She's representing herself, but she is in the senior position. She was born in Morocco, studied telecommunications engineering in Spain, um, then went to study in Germany, and then also Chinese as a foreign language in China. She's a track record in managing huge projects, but also in, 20, in August 2020, so just, a, just last month, actually, um, she published her first book in German for now, where she explains artificial intelligence to the public and pleads for more diversity in AI development. So thank you so much, Kenza, for joining us. We also have Nahima. Nahima Marshall is a doctoral candidate candidate at the Oxford Internet Institute and a researcher at computational at the Computational Propaganda Project, where her work focuses on the relationship between online political comms and effective partisan polarization. Other research interests include the spread of misinformation online and the impact of AI on politics and democratic processes. And prior to the OII, uh, Naima worked as a content editor at the Dow Jones Media Group and has um, an MA in political theory from the New School for Social Research in New York. Um, Thank you so much for joining us, Nima. And we also have, last but not least, Dion McKenzie. Dion is the founder and executive chair of Colour in Tech, a non-for-profit he set up in 2015 to make the UK's tech industry more inclusive and transparent. And having spent most of his career in Silicon Valley, Dion is an active investor and has advised many startups looking to expand internationally. So thank you all for joining us as guests. Thank you everybody who's come in. Um, to listen to the session and to participate. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with you, Dion, as, well, actually, you know, actually, let me start with you, Kenza. So you've been in the industry for quite, you've been in the industry for a long time. Um, and from the get-go, it seems you've encouraged um, and really pushed for diversity in AI. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your thesis in the book is and how exactly you're pushing for diversity in AI? Um, well, um, the, the white supremacy is unfortunately not known for everyone and the, um, the discrimination that happens from um, um, unconscious bias or, or maybe even conscious, well in most cases it's unconscious anyway, um, it's, it's not known to the public and it's not known to um, many developers either. Uh, because I, I've been discussing with them also in, on conferences and, and with different, uh, and, and different uh, uh, opportunities and they're always surprised what are you talking about this is just technology and, and no one is, is uh, racist um, so um, that's why for, for the public it's really hard to follow the discussion so that's why I, I, I decided to write the book first just to, to explain AI and the, the methodologies, the, the machine learning, and all the methodologies in, in just simple words so that everybody can understand. And then showing um, how AI is applied in all uh, different um, life uh, aspects of our lives uh, so that people feel, okay, it is already there. 
uh, and it's not science fiction because many people also think okay this is the future and it's not it's not for me and uh, anyway so uh, just to make it real it is there already and you're using it you're just not aware of it and then showing also many cases where discrimination happened and trying to explain how um, how it happens the data and and, and all this stuff uh, so for me it's it's the first step and, and until people really understand how it all works it's hard uh, uh, for them to be part of any discussion um, and then obviously they're surprised uh, okay and this is the point to start discussing how we can change it so that was uh, let's say the the long story of, <laughs> of why I wrote the book uh, but uh, yeah. so, and I think what's really quite interesting is that I, when we think about the you know diversity people often think of the people that you hire in a company, right? They don't maybe necessarily then take it from the people that are involved in, in a company will have an impact on the product itself. And is that one of the things that you're, you're kind of also pointing to is that the people, it, it doesn't, it's not as straightforward as saying anyone can, um, it's not as straightforward as sort of saying we just need to hire differently, but it's also saying the ways in which we hire affect the products we make and, and those products are, bi are having sort of biased and racist sort of outcomes. Yes, sure. And uh, it's not only the development part. I mean, we have to think this uh, through the whole uh, company life cycle, let's say. So the management has to be diverse to put this um, uh, really in the strategy of the company. Okay. Uh, so it has to be part of the corporate strategy of the values of the company. And, and then it goes from, from up through the way until the development. So when you're thinking uh, about solving a problem, so in the ideation process, you should also think about this. Uh, uh, you should think about building a product that serves everybody's needs and that's not, not only the needs of a small portion of, of the society. Um, and then you should put it in the requirements and then it goes to the development and then it goes to test and then before it's launched, it goes through a quality management. So through all these processes, um, it should be um, uh, diversity should should be there because uh, it's not um, again many people also think uh, we are trying to protect the minorities and in many cases it's not a minority <laughs> so if we're talking about uh, talking about gender diversity for example uh, women uh, worldwide they're 51 percent of, uh, of of the society so it's it's a, a small piece but still we are the bigger share of the society so it's not a minority um, um, yeah, and, and the same with ethnicities, I mean, uh, and all the other aspects, actually. Yeah, thank you. Dion, I'm going to come to you. So Colour and Tech is known um, as one, in, your, your sort of mission is to make Europe the most inclusive tech hub, um, and which I think is quite interesting because a lot of the conversation tends to focus on what's going on in the United States. How have you found like challenges in Europe unique, maybe different to what's going on in the United States? And perhaps how are people doing things differently here? Yeah, sure. So I, I kind of spend a lot of my time in between both Europe and Silicon Valley. And I think the difference um, when we set up Color and Tech was around the comfortability with talking about race, talking about diversity. Um, it was very different in Europe. It was very um, caged. It, you know, people didn't really want to talk about it and was almost in that bubble that, you know, tech is a meritocracy and, um, you know, the best ideas win and the best people get hired. Um, I think when you fast forward between the four years, um, I think a couple of things have happened. One, data has shown that the, uh, the Europe's tech ecosystem is actually less diverse than, than the US or Silicon Valley. And you saw the numbers um, as we entered um, this call, whereby most of the big tech companies in the US are hovering around, um, in terms of black representation, about three to four percent. Um, we actually did a, a research um, two years ago where we found that four percent of the UK's tech, tech um, leadership and, and board directors was actually four percent um, BME backgrounds. Um, fast forward to 2019, it actually went down a percent. So we're actually going the other way rather than, um, rather than progressing. I think ultimately this year's definitely been a, a pivotal moment um, in terms of people reawakening to the fact that we need to do something. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot more 
kind of progress to be done, but there's a lot more interest from leaders and from different players in the tech ecosystem to actually notice that there is something to be done and how do we do this um, before we get to the point where there's Googles uh, of Europe um, and you're kind of 100, 200,000 in um, employees and, and you can't really, it's really hard to turn that ship. Mm, and do you think that the change is coming sort of like leaders are deciding that they're going to change their values or is it from within companies and, and, and like employees themselves? I think there's so much external pressure right now in the, in the year that we're in and, and the time that we're in. But I think that a lot of the change has definitely been driven internally. Um, and I think what's happening, especially now, is there are people internally, workforces internally, um, of all races, of all backgrounds, who are actually standing up now and saying, you know, enough is enough. We've actually um, got to got to do something. We've got obviously got to push something forward and that's beautiful to see the intersectionality um, between different diversity met dimensions really speaking up for one another um, and so that's definitely been fascinating we've seen that in terms of walkouts protests within companies way before um, you know this year and I think that's something that leaders are you know it's, it's, it's you know impossible to avoid now um and this is something that's that's definitely moving the moving the needle in the right way mm, thank you Neem, i'm going to come to you now and one of the interesting things around white supremacy in tech and i think kenza mentioned at the beginning is that sometimes people don't have a full understanding of what that means and and how it manifests and part of it is in this idea of knowledge making whose knowledge we consider true who is real who gets to be credible and authoritative can you speak a little bit to this and then maybe how you're looking at um tackling this uh, at the oxford internet institute sure thing um I think i'm just gonna echo i mean some of the excellent points that were being made by the other speakers and i'm you know, obviously coming to this from a research perspective, I'm a researcher, I'm in academia, and I think that um, there is still to this day an enormous problem of lack of diversity. Um, you know, to this day, there's less than 1% of um, professors in the UK out of 21,000 that uh, identify as black. That is an astronomically small number. Um, and what that means is that the people who are, you know, in charge of educating um, our children and next generation of, you know, thought leaders and technologists um, do not fully represent, you know, the whole spectrum of uh, human experience. Um, I think in 2018, there were something like only 25 black women professors in the entirety of the, of the UK. So there is definitely you know, a, a diversity issue. And that's why, you know, representation is still extremely important. But as um, you, Yasmin, and, and others have pointed out, beyond representation, um, we also need to start challenging. And I think that's what really is interesting about the current moment, um, you know, who is creating knowledge and whose voice is considered as authoritative within that space. So it's not just sufficient to, um, you know, increase the number of black people within organizations, although that is extremely important, but it's also, I think, important to critically engage with how pedagogy and also power structures are, you know, dominated by whiteness. So if you think about, again, in the context of research, um, you know, curriculum and um, uh, what we are being taught, what kind of perspectives are uh, being heralded as, you know, universal, um, I think, um, you know, being able to engage critically with these forms of, of, of knowledge that might perpetuate the exclusion of, of people of color everywhere is really where the next challenge is. Um, and if we don't do that, as you know, we pointed out, then we might bake in some of these biases into um, products. Uh, we might build policies that are predicated on conceptions of human nature or how society works that actually doesn't reflect the full spectrum of human experience. And um, you know, within our department, one of the efforts that we've been trying to, to, to spearhead is trying to, to engage actually um, our faculty uh, with this question by um, demanding not only that um, we you know, increase diversity within um, faculty, but we also come to question some of the criteria on which we um, think through what is you know, excellence or um, how we come to hire and actually include um, different you know, um, members of society um, as professors or even staff in the, in, in the um, academy. And one way is I think that we can 
um, you know, do this is to um, actually come to question um, on what basis do we decide that someone is good enough? Um, and often some of these criteria, um, you know, revolve around things like, well, Let's take an example. If you think that someone who has done, you know, five different uh, unpaid inter internships in tech companies is well qualified to be um, hired in a, in a tech company, then what kind of assumptions is that based on? You know, who are the people who can afford, in fact, to you know gain these types of experiences? Um, and we tend to devalue uh, things like service work or teaching or community service. And so, by you know defining these criteria um, in advance, that this is another way in which we perpetuate certain systems that do not leave the, an open door essentially for a higher diversity of um, perspectives and experiences. Mm. Thank you so much. And there was a lot there, which I both, I saw both <clears throat> Kenza and Dion nodding to. So we're going to come to somebody um, from the chat. I think Tom Moran said a couple of things and was going to add something. But Kenza, I might come to you because I saw a lot of nodding and I wondered if there was anything. Oh, it's okay. All right, great. Um, well, Tom, are you there? Are you ready? Are you? Hi, Tom. I am here. Yes. Can you hear me? You can go ahead. Okay, great. So, so yeah, and I, I will first say first, I'm not nearly as knowledgeable as, as some of the other folks in this call about AI, but I, I work in the field. I've worked in technology for about 20 years and, and so have been, um, you know, in this industry with a tremendous lack of, of diversity and gender diversity, race diversity, you name it. And um, have recently started looking at for the projects that we're working on how to understand, I think to Ken's point, how the data set that trains an AI is so crucially important and especially at an early stage of developing the technology. And I guess, you know, I think back to, um, I'll just tell a brief story. When I was a kid, I was about four or five years old. I grew up in a very white middle-class American suburb and someone came to the door and asked for my mom. And I yelled upstairs to my mom, there's someone at the door here to see you. And she said, who is it? And I said, I think it's one of the Jackson Five, right? Because it was one of the only black people that I had ever seen in the flesh in my middle class suburb. And, and the sample size I had at that point of interaction with people of color was, was literally seeing the Jackson Five on TV as a, as a five-year-old kid. And I think that reflects how these, um, as very young technologies, AIs are being trained within environments where there's so little diversity and they're, as a result, not able to um, develop into, you know, well-rounded adults or, or well-rounded technologies. And I think that that sample size issue, and in particular, the value of the data sets that are used at the very early stages of, of training AI is super important. And I feel like we, as an industry, as well as a culture, need to understand that, you know, that artificial intelligences evolve in very similar ways to human intelligences. And maybe that's the kind of framework that we should be using to think about how we're going to nurture this technology to, to move our society forward in, in ways that are, you know, much more equitable. Mm. Thanks, Tom. And the point about data sets, I think, is, is definitely, like, goes without saying, is incredibly important. And I wondered, Kenza, if you wanted to respond to that at all. <clears throat> Actually, I was just nodding because I absolutely agree. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Do you think, oh, well, I might press you a little bit on that, because I think, do you think there's a challenge in getting data sets that are more representative? Because, or oh, yeah. at least, how do, how do we, like, de-bias these data sets? Is that even a possibility? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question and a, a very complex one. Um, of course, the, the data set and the historical data are very important in training the, the AI, and they represent us, and we are biased. Uh, so the data is biased. Now, if you want to, we, if we want to change that, uh, so just suppose we are aware of it and we want to change it, which doesn't happen automatically, but that's, uh, it's a hypothesis. We're there already, we want to change it. Um, it's not that easy because if you pick the data and change um, uh, the, the content, you would be um, fals falsifying it. So, who decides if we're allowed to, how we're allowed to, and, 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 and in, in which depth. Um, 
so it's it's not that easy let's uh, let's stay maybe with the, with the example of the recruiting um, if for example we want to hire more women for a certain position okay because we have uh, all men um, we would erase so we take the historical data which people have been hired in the past 10 years okay for this kind of uh, of a position so we check the qualifications and um, even if we delete the gender from the historical data, the neural network will still find a correlation between, let's say, uh, you played uh, um, soccer when you were young, so a hobby, you're, you played soccer, and um, um, management positions, okay? So the, the neural network correlates playing soccer with, um, is good to be qualified for management position. And so even even if you erase the gender from the CV, it's it's really it's really hard because you don't know exactly which um, aspects the neural network is going to choose for that recommendation for future recommendations. So obviously you can build. There are methods, also AI methods, uh, to help us find out um, how uh, um, to, to to just make more transparency in the decision process of a, of a neural network, which is not easy, but there are uh, uh, the um, uh, research is working on it, and there are some methodologies. And then imagine it finds out, okay, soccer was the problem. Um, would you delete all hobbies from all CVs from the historical data? So it's and, and then it will find out something else. So it's not really that easy to to change um, to change the data, mm. and. Um, yeah, so it's not the only so solution. We can try to work on that, uh, but also the, the logic that uh, we, be, we, um, we used to build the, the models. So basically the decision criteria, as, as uh, Nahima said, um, if uh, doing a, an internship, uh, five internships uh, uh, for free um, qualifies you for the job, then uh, obviously this is, uh, this is discriminating many other people. Um, so also the logic, uh, while building the models uh, should be um, um, done very consciously and um, and other steps that we will talk about uh, well, later. Um, but, yes, yeah. definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Kenza. I'm actually going to come to somebody else who made a comment in the chat. Um, Matt Valentine, uh, who made a point about whether something, whether some of these challenges are about the underlying, the, well, the fact that it's an industry dominated by technologists. Matt, would you like to speak to that? Sure. Hi there. Um, yeah, so look, I'm white, middle-aged, middle-class, straight. I'm just about as every kind of part of the problem as you can imagine. But I'm, I'm really trying to do what I can to be able to get greater diversity in the broader technology industry wherever I can do things. Um, I've been involved in managing technology in big organisations, small organisations. Currently, I run tech for a uh, social housing organization in London. Um, I think the AI debate is particularly interesting because if you look back to the earlier iterations of AI, if you go back to the 60s before my time, just 70s, 80s, it was a really much more multidisciplinary um, field of research because what that was trying to do was try to recreate intelligence. And so you'd have philosophers and psychologists and sociologists and anthropologists and engineers and, and, and linguists. And then what's happened in the last 10 years with the evolution of what we call AI at the moment, which is basically just mostly statistical analysis techniques. If you search on Google today for what skills do I need to be able to do AI, the answer will be data science, statistics, computer programming, end. And then we wonder why Twitter has racist image algorithms. And it's because the pool of people that are being selected to work in our technology these days has become so limited to just technologists. And, you know, if you think about, you know, how many chief executives of companies that aren't tech companies come from a tech background? And the answer is very few. There's another problem that they all come from finance backgrounds, but, you know. Um, so, what I wonder is, is there something about our modern tech industry today, which issues around racism, around sexism, around homophobia, around not understanding issues of age, as we get an increasing aging population, 
all stem back to actually a lack of diversity in terms of professional background. You know, the sort of decision making that thinks that Nick Clegg is the answer to your ethical problems. That that kind of, I don't know, I just don't think that the the, the tech supply industry has enough breadth or diversity of any sort in it. And so you could address issues around ethnicity, but just still like, end up with then a problem of assimilation that you still end up with the same problems. Mm. I, I just wonder how we can go about trying to be able to get technology that is designed by people other than just technologists, yeah. because that's such a narrow lens to look through to develop and deliver the systems through which all of our communication now is mediated. Mm. Thank you so much, Matt. And um, I, Kenza, do you want to respond to that as somebody involved in some of this development? Um, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. This is also a, a point I try to make every time, definitely, because we cannot just leave technologists to develop this, uh, especially because we technologists don't understand people as much. <laughs> we understand machines, but not people. And we are building machines to interact with people in all, in all aspects of our lives. So we definitely need that. And for me, this is also part of the, of, of the diversity. It's a diversity of skills, uh, of skill sets. And... Um, what, what I see happening, happening in the industry is the uh, psychologists and linguists. So those are being more involved, uh, and especially in the chatbot area. Okay, so now, now um, we do hire psychologists also to help us build the interaction, the human machine interaction, and the linguists, linguists to write, not only, but to help uh, uh, com uh, make the whole concept of a chatbot and to write the dialogues. Uh, uh, but I do agree we need more sociologists and anthropologists and, and, and uh, more uh, philosophers, although it's, it's hard to make this point to a manager to say, okay, I need, I need an anthropologist uh, in, my, in my tech team. Um, we still haven't got there, but uh, we're working on it. And I absolutely agree. We, we need that. We cannot separate humanities from tech anymore. Leon, I might also come to you on this one because I think you're somebody who's sort of like working directly with many of these startups and so on. I mean, what does the conversation look like if you say to, to somebody who's just starting, hey, why don't you have a sociologist in the team? So I, I think that's going to definitely be hard on the earlier stage um, when you're building and, and you're kind of a team under 100 people uh, to garner that. But I think what's interesting and, and why I'm hopeful for Europe actually leading the way in terms of diversity or it has the potential to lead the way is if you think about many of the big companies, um, think of Apple, Uber, think Amazon, think Facebook, think Microsoft. These tech companies normally use their European headquarters as sales and marketing hubs. So the large majority of employees in these companies are not pure play technologists, they're not engineers. Um, and so there's this idea that we can actually be a bit broad because you're looking at those roles to venture out a little bit and, and maybe um, start attracting and hiring folks that don't necessarily come from pure play tech companies. This does speak to though, given Matt's point, um, biases around who we hire and what we think good looks like or what we think great looks like. And so those backgrounds, that's why we focus a little bit more on working with tech companies to oftentimes rewire um, some of the biases that come up in the hiring and recruitment um, processes. For example, if you are um, doing a, a computer science or coming in as an engineer um, and you have three big tech and one startup name on your CV, um, there, there is positive bias affected to that, that you're going to be a better engineer um, than if you've been working in the kind of public sector, um, still doing engineering. So we still need to rewire that because um, I think that there, there is huge potential for that. But I think we also have a benefit of, you know, European um, kind of tech-based companies, a lot of which um, being the sales marketing um, kind of hubs for a lot of these companies, seeing as satellite offices. And so there's a, there's a really great example to get a bit broader um, and to really start hiring, um, you know, non-traditional, non-tech, uh, pure play employees. Mm. 
Thank you, Dion. Um, I'm now going to come to James Harding, who I know has had his hand up and has been active in the chat. James, are you there? Uh, morning, Yasmin. Well, morning, everyone. I I'm embarrassed, actually, because um, I thought to myself, this is such a treat that you're editing this and I can just sit and listen and not get involved. But I have to confess, I've got too wound up listening. Right? And so I just wanted to say why. Um, I shared in the chat the piece that we did, you know, we've done these series on tech nations, the world's biggest technology companies, treating them like countries rather than companies, right? But given their scale, that makes sense. And when you look at, we just pointed out Amazon, and this, this is to call ourselves out really, is when you look to the reporting that Alexei Mostras and the team did on Amazon, one of the things you just cannot believe is the team that runs Amazon. Right? the mix of the team that runs Amazon. So there's Jeff Bezos, there are 22 other people. Of those, I think, and this is earlier this year, so the numbers may have moved, but I think three are women out of 22. Um, as far as I can see, there are no uh, uh, African-Americans in a company that's rooted in the United States. Um, uh, I, I don't want to claim that I know the identity, but you can see it's overwhelmingly white men. Right. And, and the reason why I've got wound up listening to this is I think there's a danger that this conversation and, and the way we approach this falls into a trap. Right. And the trap is that we analyze the problem. We identify that there is a massive diversity problem and then we treat it as uh, the responsibility, if you like, of HR. Right. That it's an approach. It's a people problem. Right. And I think it's a fundamental capitalism problem, right? I totally agree with Nahima's point, which is about power structures, but where I sort of part company with Nahima is like, yes, you can fix those problems in university campuses because you've got some levers of responsiveness, right? What do you do about the fact that the world's most powerful companies are tech companies and they are singularly owned by individual white men? Right. So your, your levers of power are very limited. And the thing that I worry about when I hear this conversation is this is not a new problem. Right. This is not a problem that starts with George Floyd or starts with the dominance of tech. The, these industries have been on the rise for 30 years. Right. We are, we are dealing with a generational problem. Right. And it's found out an issue in our capitalism. Right. And the issue is, it seems to me, that we don't have levers to change, to reflect social justice within within big business. Right. And the thing that I, I would argue for is to say we've got to move this from being the problem of the HR director, the human resources person, to being the problem of the finance director and the general counsel. Right. It's either got to be a legal issue or a financial issue. Right? And until we do that, we're going to be caught in a trap where we're talking about, if you like, culture, right? Not that not, culture is not important, but culture won't change these things fast enough. Right? And we'll be here in 10 years time in 2030 talking about the lag. Right. And I go back to the Amazon question, which is when you look at the most powerful company in the world. Right. And it's so disproportionately led. How do you apply the public interest? the argument that this company has such an influence on the public interest that its leadership and the composition of its leadership matters. And that I think is really the exam question is how do you apply that in terms of financial incentives and penalties and legal ones too? Mm. Thank you so much, James. And actually there's somebody, there's a few other people in the chat that have been echoing that and there's Baptiste, Bouvier, hopefully I've not um, surprised Baptiste, but hopefully we can get Baptiste to also contribute because they were talking about this idea of incentives, um, thinking about what the levers are. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'm, so I'm, I'm a college student uh, studying in the US and I see this from, from that perspective um, as well. I, I think of a lot of, a lot of the issue is, and I, I feel like I am just echoing sentiments that have been said before, but fundamentally nothing is going to change you know the what the companies prioritize is their shareholders at least for the ones that are public and it really comes down to is this uh is this a financial issue is this you know losing us money 
And until we have a structure set, it, set up, a structure in place that may be through regulation um, or some other, some other more vocal means, until we have that, there's just really no incentive for them to change. And I think it can be a lot of pretty words, a lot of fluffy fluffiness that doesn't really materialize. Um, and so especially in, in the US, so I'm, I'm from the UK originally, but of course, a lot of my friends are um, sitting in the US and especially what's been happening the last few months, being more vocal has changed um, some things. I was interning at Facebook this summer and that was a you know very interesting experience. And I, I did see some hope um, that the more we can band together and demand for change, that that can happen. But the problem with that is you require these like specific events, it's hard to sustain. And I worry that it's just too slow. Um, and so I, I feel like we might need something, some more, something more structurally in place so that these incentives are fully aligned. It, it maybe it's like a sad answer, but I feel like that might be what we need um, when we are where we're at right now. Mm, thank you. Thank you for being honest. I think um, it's, it's difficult to, when it's such a big overwhelming problem as well, and when it's something that people have been trying to, to tackle for some time to sort of maintain, I, I think, a level of enthusiasm when, this power structures that you're challenging is so deep. Um, so I want to quickly come to Dion before I go to some more people from the chat. And Dion, I mean, what do you think as somebody who's coming from an investor point of view? Surely investors have a fair bit of power in this space as well, right? Yeah, sure. I think um, investors, yeah, I've invested in companies now for the last five, six years. I think there's a lot of power that comes with that, but it really needs to be top of mind and it needs to be your priority. Um, I think what I would point and I'd love to listening to, to some of the comments made around it needs to be more from the capitalist approach. Um, because I think that, you know, to your point, um, companies are beholden to their shareholders. I think you are starting to see um, a lot more activism there in terms of investors really thinking about this as a priority, similar to if you look last year to ESG um, and sustainability and environmental being those two core pillars that uh, investors was getting pretty loud about. Um, the second thing is I try to kind of base this conversation also on the fact that this is losing people money. So not thinking, not being diverse, not being building teams that actually build products that could have a larger mass appeal and could be used. Um, I see it as um, a kind of lost, a lost opportunity. And so if you focus it more on there, you know, I always imagine Tesla, um, the, the more sales that they could do if they actually design cars um, with, a, with a woman in mind. Um, whereas there, there are other models uh, overtly uh, masculine. So I, I, I like to kind of base it in, in that particular context. Um, I think all of these giants, although they are, um, have the potential to create more money, to create more profits, um, if they do lean into this. And it's not seen as a culture, people or representation point, but it's actually seen as a, how do we get to new markets? How do we tap a consumer base that spends trillions of dollars um, and they're not being marketed to? Um, how do we design products for the 50% of the population? Um, so with that, I, I think that, um, you know, that's where you see the change. Ultimately, though, it's still, yeah, I wouldn't say it's HR director. I'd say it's for the executive team and the shareholders um, to realize that and to realize that investment and the expected return on investment to be able to, to really lean in, in and make sure that they're actually making these changes because it, it doesn't happen overnight. These are mm. long-term systemic um, investments that hopefully in the next five, 10 years, um, you actually see, you see a return on the investment. Mm, thank you, Dion. It always reminds me that um, of the moment where folks were so surprised that Black Panther did really well in the cinema. They were like, oh my God, Black people watch movies. Like, what, who, who would have thought? Because for such a long time, the studios were like, well, we can't, you know, we can't have an all Black Marvel film because Black people just don't spend the money in the cinema. Um, yeah. And so there's definitely, I think, to your point, money to be made. The other thing I think that people often perhaps um, don't or fully sort of understand the um, 
the relationship of is how racism is so tied into capitalism and how ultimately the the reason concepts of race classification were created was essentially so that folks could benefit from slavery in a way that didn't essentially that you could you could have black folks as slaves and therefore not costing you anything and that was seen as an asset in the same way that you know um, sadly cattle was see as seen as an asset and you know you have x number of heads of cattle on your farm well similarly the people who were enslaved were seen in a similar way and you know it's only until i think 2015 that the british government stopped compensating slave owners uh for the, the lost in like money um, from from slave from slavery. So I think that we cannot actually extricate uh, racism and white supremacy from 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 capitalism. But before we, there's quite a few amazing um, points in the chat. I'm actually going to go to Nahima really quickly um, to make a, I think a point. Maybe was it on content moderation, Nahima? Ooh, maybe we don't have Nima. Um, if I could get, well, just while we're waiting for Nima, um, I know that Trevor Phillips uh, is also involved this morning. Um, could we go to Trevor at all? Hopefully. Trevor's making a point that we can't just depend on these companies to manage their own ethics, which, you know, is a fair point. Trevor? Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Good morning. Hi, sorry, I wasn't really, um, I wasn't really jockeying to get in on the discussion, but I was struck by James's point, which I think is correct. But, um, and, you know, nobody's going to argue that it's a great thing that Amazon is run by a load of white blokes. Um, but that's, you know, that's not peculiar to this sector. W what I think is probably more uh, significant and more concerning, because I completely agree with James's central point is that we have a political and media class which thinks all of this is just plumbing that is too complicated to get into and therefore let's not talk about it partly of course because journalists and MPs haven't got the first clue um, um, even about the conversation that we've been having this morning which is largely non-technical uh, I think the really more significant uh, or the more disturbing point is that both here and the United States, probably slightly less in Germany, uh, we have a political and media class which thinks that uh, the issues of the digital infrastructure, uh, of the ethics of digital and so on, is all magic. It's kind of beyond them. It needs to be outsourced to sort of clever people and uh, who are mostly, coming back to James' point, uh, white blokes, and why would we be surprised if we then have a framework which does what it does? I think that the real failure here is much less to do with the specific companies and much more to do with the absence of a particular kind of diversity in our political and media class, which has almost no, nobody, if you look at Parliament, there are very, very few people who've got any capability, any qualification, for example, in computer science, or even in the issues of ethics and philosophy of, um, of, I, of IT. Uh, and the failure, so I think the failure here actually is that the political and media class, which should be holding these great, incredibly powerful, unprecedentedly significant uh, platforms to account, really don't have the skills or the capability to, to do it. And you can see Zuckerberg in front of the um, uh, European Parliament or Zuckerberg in front of Senate, you can watch him just absolutely caning the politicians because they literally have no idea what to say to him. And he just walks out home free without any sense of being, having been put under pressure. The only thing, by the way, that they worry about is that at some point somebody is going to... Uh, do what um, the American government did a century ago and break up these monopolies. Now that in the end is, could be one of the answers, but I think that's going to be very, very difficult. I, I would just like to see a bit more focus right now on the normal process 
and machinery scrutiny, which is politics and the media, being better equipped to deal with these extraordinary, uh, unprecedented um, new entities, which we haven't seen the like of really for, you know, for 100, 150 years. I'll shut up now. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. And I think, you know, as somebody who studied engineering, I've always been fascinated by how folks who who are very smart in lots of other ways will be like, oh, I just don't know how this works. And so I'm not going to engage. And and that sort of um, refusal to engage and this belief that electricity is magic and that AI is, you know, fairy dust. And, and, and how could we possibly question what comes out of the machine, I think is incredibly dangerous. And you can't regulate what you don't understand. Um, and you certainly can't make decisions about it. We've got, we're almost running out of time. And so I'm going to come to David Smith, who's made some really fascinating points in the chat um, before then I come to Naima. Sorry, Naima. Um, David, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, this bit of uh, uh, fascinating uh, conversation. There was something I was desperately trying to find the link. So I've been on the internet whilst, uh, whilst this has been going on. But one thing that occurred to me is that, that computer science and technology hasn't had its Oppenheimer moment. Um, and I think that's a crucial thing in terms of its maturity as a science. I'm a former molecular biologist, but I work in IT now. Um, and I've been reflecting on that. I, I wish I could find the article because it was absolutely fascinating because it was pointing out that the other sciences have all had their crisis as their ability to do things was challenged by the consequences that followed on from uh, the research and learning that they'd accrued. And it, it seems to me that we are on the verge of something there in terms of um, uh, our, our ability to utilize compute power at the scale that we can use it now. Because at the end of the day, all this AI stuff is, is the ability for us to do relatively simple mechanical tasks, but at a scale um, and an ability that we've not had before and we are starting to see the consequences um, of that and I think as someone else was saying in the chat none of this I don't think is being taught in any of the classes that anybody takes you know if you do a class on ethics uh, you might hear about the trolley problem and everybody might get a little bit excited about that but the fundamentals of how to behave responsibly and safely with the technology and the power at your fingertips is not something that I think is being discussed and I'll shut up now. Thanks, David. Um, we're just, I'm going to get, try to get as many people as possible in the next little while. Neem, I'm going to come to you because there's been a fair bit that I think worth responding to. Um, and you've also been active in the chat. So go ahead. Sure. Uh, I actually just wanted to react to two points that were being made. I think that uh, were, were very prescient by James and, and yourself, Yasmin, about the intersection of capitalism and racism. I think one of the current things absolutely about the, the, the ongoing conversation that we're having now is that it is so informed by, um, you know, a, a sort of US centric framework in a way of how we think about diversity in the workplace and even, you know, our understanding of, um, you know, racial relationships and how they, how they come to, to, to impact um, the technology sector. And I think what's really missing from, from the conversation, as you pointed out, Yasmin, is um, you know, the structures of power within those you know, capitalist um, uh, companies and the impact that they have on you know, other societies and marginalized communities elsewhere. So one thing that we were talking about yesterday, for example, is content moderation. The fact that um, you know, a company like Facebook uh, essentially outsources the digital well-being of you know, people in uh, the US or the UK to workers in those countries, as well as you know, in India and in, in the Philippines. And um, you know, whilst uh, people in the US, let's say, can raise a legal case against uh, Facebook in the United States for you know, um, giving them PTSD or traumatizing them for exposing them to, to problematic content. Um, you know, a lot of the workforce and labor force that these companies employ are essentially um, being, you know, exploited for um, the well-being of its users in other parts of the world. And I think these types of power structures are just as important and just as big a part of, you know, um, the sort of white supremacy conundrum that is, that is part of the, the tech sector. Um, and then the second point that was made by Trevor, I think was very interesting um, uh, about, you know, the sort of knowledge gap within the political and um, 
you know, media class about technology. And I think that's a very important one because uh, tech companies, and this is something I pointed out in the chat, have this tendency sometimes to almost hide behind uh, the supposed complexities of, of their technological systems to justify, um, you know, not wanting to be more transparent about them. They'll just say, oh, well, you know, algorithms are black boxed and uh, we cannot, you know, even understand how they, they come to make decisions. And I think that's a, that's a false assumption. Um, explainability is possible um, within AI. Sure, there's some algorithms that are, that are harder to, to explain down the line than, than others without getting into too much detail. Um, but I think it is a false assumption and we should press and continue pressing, uh, in fact, technology companies to bake this type of transparency about decision-making processes um, into you know, the tech development pipeline. Um, and I think uh, until we have, as, as you were pointing out, uh, regulators and policymakers who understand that, uh, we're not going to be able to effectively regulate these companies. And I'll also give it up now. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you're completely right. Um, the hiding behind the complexity. I think one thing that's quite interesting when it comes to anything to do with the intersection of sort of racism and white supremacy and other subjects is um, an element of, well, you can't understand this, as somebody pointed out in the chat. And often the smartest people I know are the people that are able to distill something quite complex into something quite explainable. And so often when I hear that, I'm like, oh, what, I what is it that you're trying to hide? Or perhaps do you not yourself understand it well enough? Um, I'm going to come to uh, Daniel. Daniel has said, has sort of rebutted um, something that James Harding, a, a point about um, who actually founded a lot of these companies. Daniel Dolsteimer, are you there? Sorry. Hey, good morning. Uh, can you see me? Sorry, I'm in the sunlight. Um, I just wanted to make the point that actually a lot of these tech companies have not been founded by white men. Um, I mean, they look like white men, but actually they're not, you know, Facebook, WhatsApp, Google, Instagram, Snapchat uh, are all Jewish. Um, uh, Amazon is by a first generation Cuban, Apple by a Syrian, who was adopted by Americans. And then you've got DeepMind, who's uh, Singaporean, and then Tencent, Alibaba and Zoom are clearly all the big Chinese ones who are clearly Chinese. So whilst this might look like a white um, male dominated industry, it's actually an immigrant uh, generation. It doesn't solve the issue that you're talking about here, which is how do you get more black Africans into this space? Um, but one of the things that uh, Jews are very effective in uh, uh, maybe a, a century ago is they were excluded from society. Um, they weren't allowed to become doctors, they weren't allowed to become um, professors, etc. So they created their own industries. And uh, I'm much more interested in that sort of approach to this, which is how do we get people not to break up the current systems, but to start their own systems. And tech is very interesting for that, because if you look at all the companies I just mentioned, most of them aren't around, weren't around 20 years ago. Um, some of them weren't even around 10 years ago. And so the, the refresh cycle of this industry is very, very fast. So maybe um, we're, we're trying to look at the right target, but with the wrong methodology mm. for addressing that. That's really interesting. I'm gonna come, I'm gonna actually throw something back to you because I think that is very, very fascinating. And you're right to point out that then um, all these founders are not necessarily uh, white, but part of what I think the challenge at the moment is the sort of scale of these companies and the impact that they have quite globally. Like we, I don't think there is a comparable, a comparable historical example for the power of, of Facebook and Amazon. Um, so, and, and one of the, the things that I think regulators in the United States are looking at is the, is the monopoly power of these companies. Do you think that we're in a situation where that monopoly power can be challenged or is Facebook and Amazon just going to buy them up? No, I, I think it can be challenged very quickly. Um, uh, again, apologies for all the sun in my face. The, um, nice day. The, um, I, I was uh, very um, um, active in Europe, in the EU, in the early part of the Decade, uh, last decade, actually, you know, 2004, 2010. Um, and I got heavily involved in the Microsoft antitrust issues. Um, 
I actually was strongly supportive of Microsoft, um, not, not, not as a company, but of, of what they were trying to achieve as a company. But regulators can destroy companies really quickly and they don't have to even um, find against them, they just have to slow them down. Um, I remember the, so regulators are incredibly powerful, so that doesn't worry me particularly. Um, and if you look at some of these companies like Zoom, um, which are enormous now, and, and I don't know what area they can end up in, they're actually really, really new. You know, Zoom really hit us in March. I mean, I knew about it earlier, slightly earlier, but not, not a great deal. Um, but yes, a lot of these companies, you, you do make a point, um, and, but it's a different conversation to this. Um, it's the one about ARM, et cetera. Do, do we allow the, the large companies just to acquire smaller companies? Um, because the UK does, DeepMind is British, um, uh, Singaporean uh, mum, Demis Sisibis, um, and it was bought by Google, but who knows whether it would have been the company it is today um, without that. that. But the, the, the point is, this is a, these companies can become very, very large very, very quickly because we've never been in this environment before. We've never had a, a global tech uh, underlying basis. And Microsoft proved this with Apple in the, in the 90s, which is technology like standards. And therefore, these companies grow really quickly. But a new standard can usurp an old standard also incredibly quickly. So, no, mm. it doesn't particularly worry me, the monopolies. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. We have only a few minutes left, so I'm going to come back to our panellists. Um, Kenza, you've heard from the tortoise community. Do you have any sort of last thoughts for people to take away, given everything that you've, you've heard in the conversation? Um, this, I, I don't know where to start. Uh, we've been hearing really uh, many, many interesting points. Um, maybe one, one short, uh, um, um, I don't remember the name. I think it was it was James talking about. Okay, it has to be the agenda of a of a CFO or a, an attorney, uh, and that's I absolutely agree. Uh, just a small example: uh, at Deutsche Telekom, our governance department uh, uh, made up uh, guidelines uh, when it comes to developing AI, and they pushed it through the development. And now there is a quality check. And uh, there are requirements that we have, we have to comply with if we want to launch the product. And if we don't comply, then we're not allowed to launch it. So it's, it's just an example of um, um, the, the importance uh, of, of the requirements uh, coming from, from that part um, of the company. And in our case, it worked, but it was also because uh, one of, uh, so our uh, uh, chief um, uh, compliance officer pushed it herself and, and uh, and it was okay. But it's not the same, it's not going to happen in all companies unless there's a regulation. So this is a really uh, um, um, an exception. And, and All right. I'm going to yeah. jump in. I'm really sorry. Thank you, Kenza. Um, Dion, would you like to just a few short words as we wrap up? Yeah, sure. I think really quickly um, and to Daniel's point that gave some really great insights I think yes we have been seeing a kind of immigrant founder CEO generation for the last um, two decades um, I would say that the the American dream wasn't created equal and so you have African-American women who are the most fast-growing entrepreneurs and SME owners um, but you still have a lack of funding so I think there are some systemic things that need rebalancing um, rather than creating our own kind of destinies. Um, I, I just leave with, I think it is definitely a, a capitalist um, driven solution. And so we do need to connect um, kind of the ability for, for those unrealized potential um, outcomes and connect that to, to why, why diversity is important for, for tech companies and for tech in general. Amazing, thank you. And Neymar, I'll give you the last words. Oh, if somebody can unmute Neymar. Yes, I am unmuted. Great. Um, last points. I mean, I, I know that, um, you know, we've only sort of scrapped the tip of the iceberg, but I do think, because I'm uh, a positivist, that uh, the tip of the iceberg is important and that there is still so much to be done. I'm very excited by the fact that, you know, we're able to have these conversations now. And, um, you know, I think moving forward, it will be critical to think about how we can integrate um, these principles at every step of, you know, the um, tech development pipeline from, you know, hiring more people,
people to ideation, to algorithmic auditing, to procurement. Every step of the way, if we you know, start thinking about how these technologies and decisions are being made can you know, adversely, adversely impact some, certain segments of society, we will work towards developing better products and we will work towards reducing some of the, the, the consequences that these have. It doesn't you know, solve the uh, capitalism issue necessarily, but I think it's already a step in the right direction. Thank you so much, Kenza, Dion, and Naima. Um, if I was to summarize it really quickly, that I mean, there's been so much, but number one, there's definitely opportunity for improvement and so much scope for it. Um, number two, it cannot be just HR. This needs to be something that is a priority for people at the top and also seen as just as important as finance and legal and all these other skill sets. Um, and number three, to lean in and to learn because this is as much a skill set as any other subject matter and it is not magic um, and so you too as individuals can really lean into this thank you so much to tortoise thank you um to hatusia i always say it wrong sorry alice and thank you all so much for joining us today and and enjoy the rest of your morning